Welcome everyone. My name is Margaret Rossi. I am the program director for the Design Thinking Certificate Program and Courses at UNC Charlotte School of Professional Studies. And I am accompanied here by Mr. David Phillips, our instructor for the program, as well as my colleague, Michael Utzman, who is going to uh, be serving as a technical producer for this uh, session. Welcome to this design thinking information session. We're just so happy to have you join us. This is going to be one hour. And in that short time together, we're going to cover a lot of information. But what I'd like to do is just go over a few housekeeping rules just to make sure that we all know how to engage and we all can get the most out of this session. So first of all, your mic and video have been disabled um, due to the volume of people that are participating in this session. Uh, it was initially uh, disabled. However, there will be opportunities for you to um, unmute yourself and be able to share uh, questions and information that, that you would like to share with us and engage with us. What I would um, recommend is to use the chat box uh, initially, uh, if you have any issues uh, technically, or if you would like to comment on something, or if you would like to ask a question, feel free to go to the chat box, choose everyone, and you can um, basically uh, state your comment. If by chance you have a technical issue and you want to do a private message to Mr. Michael Lutzman, feel free to do that as well. Uh, we've allowed that. So thank you all uh, for being here. You also just heard that uh, recording was in progress. This session is recorded. So tomorrow you are going to receive an email that will have this slide deck as well as some additional documents and this recording of this session. You'll have a link. So I wanted you to be aware of that. Today, you received some information about how to get into this session, as well as a document or two as additional resources uh, about an hour ago. And, uh, and tomorrow, you'll get more. So I wanted uh, to um, share that with you. So what I'd like to do now is go over the information session agenda and see if this um, sounds good to you. We're gonna start off with literally one minute on UNC Charlotte School of Professional Studies, the Continuing Education Department. That's where all of the design thinking courses as well as numerous uh, certificate programs and courses are housed. So I just want you to know what we're all about. And then I would like to hand this over uh, to Mr. David Phillips, and he's going to share with you uh, the concept of design thinking and what it is. So this way we all have an understanding of this uh, methodology. And we're gonna go through an overview of the certificate program. And when is this program offered? How long are the courses? In what learning modality are they offered in? What is the cost of these programs and these courses? Are there any discounts available? If you are something called certified, are there, is there professional credit associated with these courses? And so on. So we're gonna cover all those specifics with you. We're also gonna talk about the requirements if you indeed want to achieve this certificate. And on the flip side, if you only wanna do certain courses, what is, what, what is that availability? We're then going to talk about the course content. So we're going to drill a little bit deeper and give you an overview of what's covered in each course. And as a whole, what are the benefits of taking the design thinking certificate program at UNC Charlotte School of Professional Studies? Uh, what, is, what benefits is this gonna help you with it, at the workplace? And of course, how are you going to register for this program? Uh, do you do it just online? Is there a phone number? You know, what's the fastest way and the most efficient way uh, for you? And so I'm hoping to answer that question. We absolutely 
We'll stop at the end for questions, but by all means, David and I want to encourage you that if you have any questions through this journey and through this hour together, that you share it with us uh, and, and put it in the chat box for now, okay? So before I move on, can you please go to the chat box and let me know if this looks good for you? Is there a, an additional item that you are um, wondering that we're gonna cover and possibly I didn't mention that you need to have covered? Um, I'm looking at chat right now. I don't see any feedback. Um, some of you are saying yes, it looks good. So I, I just share with all of you that if by chance any questions come up about an additional item that you need to be aware of with this program, feel free to put it in the chat um, and we'll be happy to answer it for you. So thank you so much. So now I'm going to hand this over to David. Awesome. Thanks, Margaret. So as we think about the last year and a half or so, uh, I mean, there are so many different ways to describe it. And at risk of making light of what has been a, a terrible situation and different degrees of terribleness for different people, I think of one way to look at this is basically, you know, we've been derailed, but not just derailed, right? Whether it's individually or teams or companies or communities, what have you. But in addition to just, you know, a regular derailment, also dealing with a tornado that seems to be spitting out sharks. Yes, we're talking about Sharknado. What's going on? So why do I bring this up is because it seems like what we've been having to do and what we will continue to have to do within our organizations, responding to disruptions, being able to, we're going to need to be able to identify rapidly changing customer needs, right? What they needed yesterday is not what they need today, what may not be what they need tomorrow. And then also about, we're going to need to engage employees in meaningful ways, right? For so many organizations where people are coming back to work, whether it's some hybrid environment, in person, whatever it may be, how do we deal with all that, right? The world has changed. There's no such thing as let's just go back to the way it was before, right? The, the world has changed and we're going to have to adapt to that. I bring all that up because, and obviously I'm biased because this is what I do, but design thinking is a fantastic discipline, right? A set of tools and a set of ways of looking at the world to approach those challenges and more. So what is design thinking? Good question. I'm glad you asked. Well, let's dive into it. So first, let's talk about what is design before we get into what is design thinking, because for some folks, they may think, oh, design is about just, you know, making things pretty. It's about the packaging or the coloring, right? It's the aesthetic. Uh, it's so much more than that. So let's let's back up a little bit. What sort of things actually get designed? So, you know, brochures get designed and websites get designed, right? That may be the first things that come to mind, but then we can go so much deeper. Right? Items get designed, machines get designed, like an MRI machine. Entire systems get designed, like the healthcare system. Processes get designed, right? An onboarding process for new hires, or in some cases, a re onboarding process. And then entire experiences can be designed, right? For better or for worse. And so the notion that design is just making things pretty is, is just incorrect, right? It's, or it's incomplete, it's insufficient. That I'm of the opinion that this quote just sums it all up, that anything that's touched by people, that's transformed by people is by its very nature designed. Another way to think about this, if it doesn't occur in nature, then it has to be designed. Again, for better or for worse by people, either intentionally or unintentionally. So with that as a little background, let's get back to this question. So what is design thinking? Well, several different ways to answer this question. One is that it is a discipline that leverages the principles and practices of designers, right? People who have been formally trained as designers, these are the tools they use. Like empathy, embracing ambiguity, and failing fast, right? In order failing fast to get to the correct solution, the better solution sooner. But design thinking is also both the way of thinking and a way of working, right? It's mindset and tool set. And then lastly, we think of it as a human-centered approach to innovation. All right, so what does that mean? Well, 
we think of this as it's looking at your challenges and opportunities through three lenses. How many lenses? Three lenses. Thanks for playing. So lens number one is desirability. What is it that people actually want or need? Whomever it is you're serving, it might be your customers, it might be your employees, it might be volunteers, it might be students, whomever. What do they want or need? The second lens then is feasibility. What can we do with our know-how, with our resources to address those wants or needs? And then the third lens is viability. What can we do in a way that makes sense financially? Right, it fits within our budget or it's profitable or whatever may be, it's sustainable. So when we're creating human-centered solutions to our challenges, right, we need to look through all three of these lenses. But for it to be truly human-centered, we need to start with desirability, right? Start with by understanding what people actually want or need. And design thinking is just incredibly well-equipped to do just that, right? A human-centered approach to innovation, a human-centered approach to problem solving, a human-centered approach to designing experiences. So is there a framework for this? Of course there is. What I'm going to quickly walk you through is the six step framework, but I'll I have to pause right here just to tell you that there are as many different versions of this framework as there are consultants, as there are educators, as there are books and articles and TED Talks and what have you. And it's been my experience that in essence, they're almost all the same. It's just how they're sliced and diced, right? So we're going to share with you a six stage framework, but if there's some that are four, some that are eight, some that are three, it's all the same stuff. It's just how it's divided. So design thinking starts with discovery. Um, and discovery is about, again, this is where the empathy comes in. Let's find out what people actually want or need. And what are the opportunities out there? What are the unmet needs that people are dealing with? That Those unmet needs represent opportunities for us to do something better. Then framing or reframing our challenge or opportunities to make sure we're solving the right problem. Sometimes, especially when things are chaotic, especially when we're really busy, when we don't have a lot of time, we certainly don't have any extra time to do stuff, we tend to start solving the problem that's presented to us as initially framed or as initially presented. And sometimes, I mean, most of the time that's fine, but with really wicked problems or really complex problems, sometimes we end up solving the wrong problem or we solve a problem that doesn't actually need to be solved. So framing and reframing is making sure we're solving the right problem or finding a better problem to solve. After that, it's ideation, it's brainstorming, right? It's coming up with the ideas, you know, how might we address this problem that we framed? And one of the important things here is that we have to separate to do this well, because it's really easy. My, I have no doubt that everyone on this call, everyone on this webinar has been in a really poor brainstorming session, because it's easy to do brainstorming poorly, unfortunately. The good news is that it doesn't take a lot to actually do it a lot better. Right, just a few changes. And so we'll talk about how we go through that in this course. But the, one of the biggest is that separate idea generation from idea evaluation. Just doing that alone, you get a lot more progress. But anyway, ideation is then the next step of this framework of this approach. Then it's followed by prototyping. And if there's any magic, if there's any magic at all in this design thinking discipline, it's here. And it's not because prototyping is itself magical, it's because we tend, most organizations, most environments, we don't do it. And we define prototyping very broadly. It's simply making a visual representation of your idea, of your concept, so that others can understand it and then react to it and give you feedback on it, meaningful feedback, candid feedback, because they understand what it is you're saying. So once you're prototyping, then you go to test your idea. Right? One of the other principles of design thinking is what's better than a good idea? A testable idea. So we talk about how we can go about testing our ideas for validity. And then eventually you've got to launch. Eventually you got to ship. Eventually you've got to write, okay, well, it's great to go through this process, but when do we actually put stuff out of the world for people to use? And so launching and thinking about how you go about launching. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different ways to slice and dice the design thinking framework. And even us, we cut it into the, uh, to these three slices that it first starts off with insight gathering and opportunity framing. That's followed by a conversation of possibilities. What could we do? Followed by a conversation of reality. What should we do? And in fact, the, ge the geometry, right? The diagram itself is instructive. Is that what's called this double diamond, that it's the divergent convergent, right? We zoom out, we zoom in. We zoom out, we zoom in. And this model may appear to be linear, but it is anything but linear. 
right? We'll constantly jump back and forth as we learn new things, as new insights are uncovered, as assumptions are busted in order to continue to make progress. And so as part of this framework, and again, we're gonna go into detail of this in the program itself, but I just wanna give you a, just a basic understanding of how everything that's gonna underpin what we'll cover in this course. But if this makes sense, I wanna share with you just simply one last visual that another way to look at design thinking is like this, is that it is about intentionally embracing ambiguity and chaos and messiness at the beginning so that we can get to better sooner. And sooner oftentimes mean cheaper, right? We can get there faster, take, it costs less time, it costs us less money. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Margaret to talk about the School of Professional Studies. Great, thank you. Um, just a quick minute on this. Um, our UNC Charlotte School of Professional Studies, the Office of uh, Continuing Education, uh, offers a series of short courses, one and two day courses, very similar to uh, several of the courses that you're gonna find in the design thinking program. We also offer certificate programs, which is a series of courses that uh, will be found in a program and you will receive a certificate from UNC Charlotte School of Professional Studies uh, that you have completed that program. And we also have recertification courses. And so I'm assuming now that you may feel comfortable with the term certification versus certificate. So I just thought I would throw that out there that the certificate program is a series of courses. And uh, surrounding a body of knowledge and you will receive tools and resources that you can apply in the workplace. And then you will receive a certificate from UNC Charlotte. A certification in any industry typically means you have to have years of experience in the field to be eligible. And there is a governing body that created a credential to show your expertise in that field. And so you would take a test. So you have the experience and you would take a test and some certifications, there is another element to it as well. But with all that said, if you are certified in a particular industry, you need to sustain it. And therefore each year you have to earn specialized professional credit. So I'll be sharing in just a few moments, uh, the professional credit tied to uh, this program. Can you please in the chat box very quickly uh, let me know if any of you are certified, whether you're a project manager, whether you are an HR certified professional, a hospitality professional. I'm just curious. I'm just taking a look at the chat box. I don't believe I have um, anyone certified. Uh, but I wanted to bring that up. Um, so let's talk about the big picture overview of the design thinking courses and the certificate program. So let's just chat about it. As far as the course delivery, what I want you to be aware of is this program, these courses are offered once a year in the fall. We are delivering this live online, virtual, using Zoom. So this is not asynchronous where it will be taped. This will be live classes using the video conferencing Zoom. Uh, and Zoom you will find in our learning management system called Canvas. It's nothing more than a shell that will keep all of your Zoom classes as well as all of your criteria and materials. We have available, and uh, David will be sharing this with you shortly, we have available four courses in uh, the design thinking um, arena. And each course is going to be offered over two evenings. So each course is two evenings, and you'll be seeing that shortly, uh, Tuesday nights. You can take a course individually or you can take all the courses necessary to achieve your certificate. To achieve the certificate in design thinking from UNC Charlotte School of Professional Studies, you need to take all four courses. 
As I had mentioned, each course is two evenings. So you are looking at eight evenings, eight uh, Tuesday evenings over the course of 24 hours. Each course, each evening course is three hours. You will be meeting from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, in those courses. But you can, um, wonderful. Uh, the registration fee for each course is $549. If you take all four courses, it will be the fee of $2,196. And that will include your resources, your tools that we're gonna be sharing with you, your electronic materials. There are discounts available. And I'd like you to know them all right away because you may fall in one of these categories. If you were to register for this course, a course or all courses up to two weeks before the course start date. I happen to use the very first course. Two weeks before the first course would be September 21st. You would receive a 5% discount. If you're a UNC Charlotte alumni, you receive 10% discount. If you are a member of a professional organization called ATD or SHRM, the Association for Talent Development, or the Society for Human Resource Management, you do receive 15% discount. I honor those that are in those fields and are trying to sustain their credentials. There's also a corporate volume discount. If by chance you were, uh, you were going to register for this program along with several of your colleagues, three or more, you receive 15% discount. And we've had a number of companies take advantage of this. Lastly, and I just wanted to share this, if you were to do all four design thinking courses, we have a new discount called the bundle discount. And you would receive 15% discount if you signed up for all four at once. And I have a number of individuals who have signed up for this program already who have signed up for all four right away and they've received a discount. If you are planning to do the whole certificate, what is necessary? Oh, I'm sorry. This is the, um, the professional credit information, excuse me. Every one of the courses in the design thinking um, catalog that you are considering taking, each one has been pre-approved by the following um, organizations. So the first one is because we are an accredited institution, we will award continuing education units, CEUs for each and every course. If you do all four courses, uh, then you will be able to bundle all of those credits. The next would be HRCI, Human Resource Certification Institute. If you take one course, it has been pre-approved for six HRCI business credits. And this is important for anyone that is in human resources. Uh, if you are a senior level, uh, senior uh, HR professional, you need to acquire so many strategic credits. And this particular program um, has been pre-approved for six credits. If you do all four courses, then HRCI will uh, award 24 credits. The next is SHRM professional credit, the Society for Human Resource Management. Each course is six credits. And if you take all four courses, SHRM has certification, uh, professional credit, uh, PDCs, they, they're called professional development credits, to be awarded uh, to the HR professional, uh, 24 credits. And lastly, if you are an L&D professional, a learning and development professional, and you are certified as a certified professional in learning and performance, ATD, the Association for Talent Development Certification Institute has pre-approved every one of the courses 
and the whole certificate as well for uh, six ATD points. They're called uh, APTD or CPTD recertification points. I realize I'm going through a series of acronyms, but APTD is the um, an associate professional in talent development and CPTD just, this is a brand new acronym uh, for uh, certified professional in talent development. It used to be a CPLP. And if you have acquired these certifications, ATD Certification Institute for these courses and this certificate will award you specialized credit. So I wanted to just share that with you for all my professionals in this class session. If you are interested in achieving your certificate, we are offering the certificate in the fall, as I mentioned. All four courses will span from October 5th through November 30th on Tuesday evenings as shared. No prerequisites to gain entry into this program. You will have the opportunity to uh, take these, this program live online. However, I have put in a caveat here, and I think all of you in this session can agree with me when you are participating in a virtual class, it really is a good idea to have high-speed internet, have a camera so you can engage, and be able to have good audio connection so you can communicate and, and really get the fullest, uh, the full portion out of the, out of the program. And have a good microphone as well. Uh, you must take all four courses in order to achieve the certificate. And that once again makes up eight Tuesday nights, six to nine, 24 hours. And with that said, you need to attend. And, and what I mean by that is because it is a virtual live class, recordings don't take the place of attendance. So really your attendance, and this is a very interactive session. We want you interacting. We want you getting the most out of this program. And uh, so 100% attendance. And then you will receive your certificate at the end of the program. And I think this is yours, David. Awesome. Thanks, Margaret. So with all this being said, who should actually attend? Obviously, you're here tonight because you're interested in attending. But who is this for? Who's going to benefit? Well, I would say those who seek to develop innovative products or programs or processes to particularly address the disruptions we're already facing and any future disruptions we're going to face, right? Because the world is not done changing on us. Anyone who is looking to intentionally design experiences that delight customers, again, or employees or other stakeholders and keep them coming back, right? To retain those people you've worked so hard to attract. To engage employees in meaningful ways to solve complex problems. We know that employee engagement has long been a challenge for a lot of organizations or something they want to get better at, again, to both attract and retain top talent. Uh, and now it's gonna be even more important to do that, both because of the types of challenges we're facing and because you're in this job market, right? It's a talent market. People can go where they want, where they feel uh, needed, where they feel wanted and where they can develop. And one great way, one proven way to develop people is to engage them in, in problems that need to be solved, right? Meaningful problems and design thinking can help you do that. And lastly, lastly, anyone who's simply looking to strengthen their own creative problem solving skills by learning how to see and how to think and how to work differently. So if any one or more of these apply to you, then you are absolutely in the right place. So let's talk about what we're actually gonna cover in these four modules. So in class one, which again is two nights, we'll give you an introduction to design thinking and talking about how, how to learn how to see with fresh eyes. So some of the stuff we'll tell, we'll go into detail on that design thinking framework that I just covered briefly. We'll really dive into the role of empathy in innovation. This is absolutely fundamental to design thinking. It's again, if you're going to create human centered solutions, human centered products or services or programs or whatever, it is so important to understand what it's like to be them, right? Look at it from their point of view, really deeply understand what people are want or need, even if they can't tell you, even if they can't articulate it. Ethnographic research is a form of of observational research, right? It's going into the fields, going into where people are to study what they do, where they do it, to understand what those challenges and opportunities are. 
All right, we'll talk about how to go and conduct these observations, how to conduct interviews to really elicit information from people uh, so that we can then start figuring out hmm, what are the challenges that would be worth solving. And then once you do that sort of research, that sort of qualitative research, then you got to make sense of it. You got to go through and analyze and synthesize and make sense of it. So we'll talk about and show you how to go about doing that. Class two is co-creating solutions to problems worth solving. Again, two more uh, sessions. We'll talk about problem framing. We'll go into detail about some techniques about how to go about framing your problems differently. We'll go into specifics techniques around how to generate ideas and how to evaluate ideas and why it is so important to separate those two things. Um, we'll look at rapid prototyping and how to go about doing this. Again, we define prototyping very broadly. It's simply making visual representations of your ideas so that others can understand it. So we get a shared understanding, both the people that you're working with, you're collaborating with, and people that you need feedback or sponsorship or buy-in from. And then about how to go around testing your concepts to gather more feedback, right? Different types of uh, products or solutions or processes lend themselves better or worse to different types of testing uh, techniques and testing uh, tools. Class three is about specifically focused on designing inclusive products, services, and experiences. We'll look at the three rules of inclusive design. For example, if you ask 100 people what does inclusion mean, you might get 100 different answers. But if you ask 100 people what exclusion means, you're going to get a lot of similar answers. It means not being included, it means not being able to play. And so one of the, the first rule of inclusive design actually is recognize exclusion. And just by doing that, looking at who's not, who's not invited to play here with this product or this program or this service or this whatever, so we'll dive deep on how inclusive design can really inform any sort of product or process or service design. We'll look at journey mapping as a tool to really understand, again, your customer's journey or your employee's journey, your volunteer's journey, whomever it is you are trying to serve. What's it like for them? What's working well? Where are there opportunities to do better? And that notice the, the Focus on where are there are opportunities to do better, right? Looking for those specific moments in their journey that matter most. That we don't necessarily have to optimize the whole thing, but finding those moments that truly matter and then focusing our efforts there. Because, right, we know about first impressions matter, but so do last impressions. Last impressions are our lasting impressions. So we'll look at, you know, those two elements are always moments that matter, but there may be others along the journey as well. And then in class four, it's really wrapping all this up about how do we take a human-centered approach to spark sustainable change in whatever context you're looking at. So how to sell your idea. So not selling or marketing, but in terms of how do you influence others to get on board, to buy in, to also go and you know spread the word. Again, whether you need internal buyers, external buyers, whomever they may be. We'll look at a very specific tool around communication called No Feel Do. It's an, it's an empathetic tool. It's a human-centered approach to communication. And it's really thinking about understanding what is a result of this talk, this presentation, this whatever it is, this email, if it's really important, what I want my audience to know, what I want my audience to feel, what I want my audience to do as a result of this message. Because all too often, again, especially when we're in a hurry, or we've done this before, right, because we, we're deeply experienced in whatever we do, we just jump into, here's what I want you to know, and here's what I want you to do. And we kind of leave out the feel part. So we're gonna dive into why that's important and how we can go about doing it. We'll look at designing for behavior change, because a lot of times if you're, going, if you're looking to launch some innovative product or service or process or program or whatever it is, oftentimes it's going to require some people to change their behavior. And so we need to think about how we design either into the product itself or into the launch itself, how we influence, how we nudge people into this behavior versus that behavior. So there are a lot of tools, a lot of principles around that. And then lastly, we'll kind of tie all this up as it comes to change about the mice versus the maze, because sometimes we think the problem is the mice. And it's not, it's the maze, it's the environment, it's the conditions, it's the tools we're giving them, it's the nudges that we're giving or the nudges that we're not giving them that actually impact uh, how people behave. So we'll look at all that, how it rolls into successfully launching some new product or service or process. 
So what are the benefits of taking this program, right, of going through these four modules, these eight classes? Well, we'll boil it down to these few points. One, you learn a structured yet flexible approach to solving complex problems, design experiences, and or to disrupt the status quo. You'll learn how to, you'll understand how design thinking can be used to overcome organizational barriers to innovation. Uh, what I found, the larger the organization, the more barriers there are, and they're not intentionally set up. That's just how the system works, right? When we are focused on let's get stuff done, let's be really efficient. Well, sometimes efficiency can be counterproductive. Over-focusing on efficiency can be counterproductive to being innovative because you got to be willing to try and you got to be willing to experiment. You have to be willing to fail and failing is by very nature inefficient. So how can we overcome those barriers so we get both we can focus on innovation and focus on efficiency. And you'll learn how human centered design can be applied in a wide range of settings, right? This is just not about uh, developing products or services. It is about developing solutions. It's about problem solving. It's about designing experiences. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Margaret to talk about how we register for this program. Thanks. And I just wanted to add another benefit that I, I have seen through the years is students really love to learn these techniques, acquire the tools, especially those tools that is going to help them apply design thinking, this whole process, design thinking in the workplace. So um, a, a lot of these um, tools can be so useful in everyday practice. So I, I wanted to share that. As far as registration for a design thinking course, or all of the courses, you can absolutely go online. You can go to continuinged.uncc.edu forward slash design, or even if you just go to continuinged.uncc.edu, the choice will be there. There is a certificate called design thinking and you'll be able to uh, register. I would like to say, I really encourage you to call our registration phone number. They're so fantastic and they expedite the process so quickly for you. So you could call 704-687-8900 and you would be able to register. If by chance your company is going to reimburse, your employer is going to reimburse you for these courses, then we would want you to call our registration office because they will find out who they have to invoice and what they have to do um, in order to expedite the process. And remember, we have the early bird discount, which is 5%. But if you do wanna bundle all four courses together, you get 15% discount. And once again, it's just really nice to utilize our registration department because they're there Monday through Friday, eight to five. Uh, but if you wanna do it at night, you can surely go online. So with that said, uh, we have some time and I think we can open this up. Uh, the last slide in, in this presentation is my contact information, David's contact information, and you can absolutely contact us directly and ask questions. But we would love to open this up. We've kind of given you an overview of what is design thinking? What are these courses? What are we going to cover? What is expected within a certificate program if you decide to do all four? And I want to open it up to you to see if there's any questions that we can help you with. And if you want to speak, um, either click the raise hand button or go to the chat box and say you would like to speak and uh, our Producer Michael will unmute you. All right, I see the question from Daniel. So my background in design thinking, how did I become interested in the approach? Uh, the short to medium uh, version of that uh, response is 
I got lucky. I stumbled across it. So I, sp uh, I started my company, Faster Glass, in 2010 uh, to basically go help people learn how to apply design thinking. But prior to that, I spent six years at Bank of America. Uh, started off initially as a learning consultant, as a performance consultant. I simply got handed a project. One of our technology execs had gone to a conference and heard about this thing called design thinking. This was 2005, 2006. And at that time, Bank of America was deeply deeply immersed in its embrace of Six Sigma as, as kind of a, just the way to do things. And if you're not familiar with Six Sigma, I know some of you are, but if you, those of you who may not be familiar, one of Six Sigma's um, kind of foundational principles is that variation is the enemy. If we're going to do something 20 million times, we want to do it the same way every time, which makes sense. But if you're trying to be innovative and variation is your enemy, what's well, going to be really, you know, those two things are hard to, to, to square. So anyway, a technology exec had heard about this stuff called design thinking. It simply landed on my desk. Hey, go to Boston, talk to these smart guys. Let's figure out this is something we ought to be doing, um, particularly within our technology uh, departments. And I go and find out of this, and it literally, I'm hearing the bells ring, right? It's like the angels are saying like, wow, this is a thing. This is There's a whole discipline and a set of tools around this. So my last four years at Bank of America became basically an internal evangelist and helping folks understand these two disciplines, Six Sigma and design thinking, can actually coexist, right? It's just different tools. What are we trying to do? And we can apply the right tools at the right time. Uh, and after four more years of doing that at Bank of America, it dawned on me that I could go do this somewhere else, maybe lots of somewhere else's. And so through my consulting firm, we've been able to work with from large companies to small to mid-sized companies to government agencies to school systems to nonprofits. And so, uh, which has informed my understanding and my experience with this is so applicable in so many places where people are involved, either in doing the work or people are being served. Something I failed to mention at the, uh, earlier in this overview is that I firmly believe, and, I, and I've got enough experience now to, to back this up, is that most of design thinking, and, this, and you may have heard this or had this thought as we were going over it, it's not rocket surgery, it's not. In fact, I say a lot of it, it's common sense, it's just not common practice. Uh, and it ties in and borrows from other disciplines. So if you looked at that framework and thought, wow, this, is, this looks like the scientific method, because it is the scientific method, right? Have a hypothesis, do some testing, take your results, let that then inform your hypothesis and move forward. Just kind of building on the empathy on the front end, so we're making human-centered solutions. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks for that, Daniel. Ah, yes, a B of A alum, of course. Uh, green, <laughs> green belts for all. You get a green belt, and you get a green belt, and you get a green belt. Indeed. So it's not to say that's not a great, I mean, it's a great approach when properly applied. Design thinking is a great approach when properly applied. If it's not properly applied, then it's, it's no more useful than any other tool. Thanks for the other questions. How can businesses use design thinking to reboot during the post COVID-19 world? Great question. Uh, generally speaking, right? Cause it's gonna depend on the business, on the industry, on um, geographically where they're located. Um, I think at, that, at the core of it, Right, it's about a human centered. So in this case of rebooting, like what do my employees need? And what do our customers need? And how have those needs changed? How are they different today? And how might they be different tomorrow? So one of the things the US military has struggled with for years, but the same thing applies to I think lots of businesses in lots of different contexts is getting really good at fighting the last war. Like, this is how that one works, so we should just get better at that. Then all of a sudden, you know, today's war is, oh, oh, this is different. Now we got to figure this out. And then we just keep repeating that cycle. So I think for a lot of businesses, I mean, so many of us, right? It's just human nature. When can we go back to normal? When can we go back to doing things the way we had been doing them before, when it worked, at least, if not fine, better than it's working now? Well, this isn't about that. This is, all right, what do my people need? What do our customers need? What do our partners need? What do our uh, vendors need? And then how, what do they need? And then how might we address those? One of the other key principles of design thinking is wherever possible, 
design with, not for your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So design with your employees, design with your partners, design with your customers. You can find out because sometimes they can't just tell you what they want or what they need. You got to go, you got to go dig. So mm -hmm. that's one way businesses can use this. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas, your question, where is design thinking not applicable? Um, I would say where nothing is going to, nothing has changed, nothing is going to change. You know what the future is going to look like, and it's going to look like exactly what today looked like, and it's going to look like what yesterday looked like. If there's no chance of change or disruption that you really, all you really need to do is just keep doing what you're doing as well as you can do it, optimize efficiency, then design thinking may not be applicable. In an environment where everything, and I mean everything has been automated, everything has been automated, then you may not need design thinking. But for places where people are involved, people have to collaborate to do stuff, people are trying to do stuff for other people, right? For their customers, for their clients, for their communities. Well, then this, this can be really useful. The other way I would answer that question is design thinking is particularly appropriate for really complex problems, really wicked problems. For simple things like, hey, where should we move this chair? Well, let's convene a bunch of people and let's go through some exercise. Let's define the problem. Like, no, just why don't you put it over there by the window? Call it a day. Mm -hmm. All right. You don't want to take you don't want to put a, a cannon to kill a mosquito. But for really complex things, so trying to find the right problems to solve, design thinking can be useful in identifying where it should be best applied. And since I can't see you, I'm hoping that <laughs> these responses are at least semi useful. Yep. I think one of the things this kind of goes back to a little bit to uh, Daniel's question, what interested me in the approach originally, what keeps me interested? Because I get bored easily, that is just a personal and professional deficit, uh, I get bored easily. And what I have found with this, because I've been doing this now for 15 years, is that because it can be applied to so many different situations that I'm still constantly learning. And so, you know, I'm constantly learning and then that keeps informing this course. This course is, has never been the same from year to year to year. We're constantly tweaking it, constantly adding new stuff uh, and new tools and new, new lessons. Here's what's worked, here's what's not working as well. And so I say that to also say this, one of the other aspects of this course, <clears throat> whether it's in person or virtual, obviously this year it'll be virtual, is that there is a good amount of peer learning that goes on as well, right? I'm not the only person in the room who's going to know stuff. I'm certainly not going to be the smartest person in the room. I'll be sharing some stuff with you. Hopefully you'll, you'll find it to be engaging, but it'll be your responsibility as well to be both the discerning learner. How would I use this? And then to share both your your ahas and your questions and your concerns and your skepticisms with me and with one another, because we're going to learn from each other as well. All right, so Margaret, I see no more questions. I'm going to turn it back to you. Yes, absolutely. Well, I want to thank all of you for participating and for your questions and as we mentioned, this last slide shows our contact information. We're going to uh, share tomorrow the PowerPoint presentation, the recording uh, for your reference, and additional resources. And uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact myself or David. We'd be happy to help. And thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.